Mark, you scare me. Mark is one warm energy drink away from just losing it. Look away, look away, look away. All right, y'all. Thank you for tuning in to Dixieland, the proletariat. We're going to talk about Southern working class history and current events or leftist perspective. Make sure to like us on social media at Dixieland, the proletariat, or find all of our links at our link tree at linktree slash dot prol. That's D-O-T prol, where if you want to give your wages to a bunch of rednecks, you'll find a link to our Patreon. We got some cool stuff to give you, including CDs, stickers, a cookbook, Discord server, and exclusive episodes. We also have a Spotify playlist with some great artists y'all should check out, as well as our merch store. This podcast is brought to you by contractional monogamy, not being able to afford therapy, living at home, beta blockers, guys are pushing white men in the swamps, Nelson's love life, Tyler's hiatus, and sweet Mark's laughter, which brings joy to the masses. And whoever posted the Supreme Court justices credit card info. <laughs> Shout out to a new Patreon subscriber, Adam. Our monthly surplus goes to groups that are run by and or help marginalized people directly. As always, I'm Nelson with Mark. And I'm just angry. <laughs> and Hi, I'm, angry. Hi, angry. And I'm our, dad. How are you? <laughs> oh, my God. And our guest this evening is... C. McFarland. Hey, Darcy. Hey. Yay. Hey. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, at time of recording, we're all just talking to each other for the first time since... Uh, what was that? Monday, the what 25th, 26th ruling from the Supreme Court. Uh, that will be talked about later, but that's not what this episode is about, in case anybody's expecting that. Yeah, we'll definitely uh <laughs> we'll definitely have our good friend Mia back on to talk about that uh when uh when she's feeling a lot better because she is not feeling good right now, if anyone can imagine uh what that's been like. Um but yeah, so today we have Darcy on who's going to talk to actually Darcy I'll, I'll I'll give it to you tell us uh, tell us about your organization what you all do and all all that good stuff Sure um I am the creator and editor of Bible Belt Queers it is actually it started out as a book um so the first copy of the book it came out in December of 2019 right before the pandemic hit and it has the work of 78 LGBTQIA artists from all over the Bible Belt, um, poetry, essays, and full color visual art about our experience growing up as a queer person in the Bible Belt um, and how that has really shaped our lives. So that's how it started. And it's just kind of been a continuing project from there. I um, finished the first zine earlier this year and it's on being queer in the time of COVID. Um, and there's a new zine um, call for submissions out as well. So if you are a queer person in the Bible Belt, please um, consider submitting if you have something to say about being queer during this time, which I feel like so, so many of us do. Um, so yeah, it's a continuing project that has just kind of evolved from there. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. Have y'all been, uh, what, have y'all been doing anything special for Pride Month? Um, so it's kind of like, a loosely held collective right now, you know, I um, am the ones behind the scenes kind of um, managing the social media and filtering through all the submissions and putting it together and everything. Um, but everybody is doing kind of like their own separate thing for Pride Month. A lot of us are doing pop-ups. I have personally done three different pop-ups. Um, I'm working with um, this really amazing group in Northwest Arkansas called The Big Gay Market, where um, they're organizing um, the first and only queer makers markets in Arkansas. And it started last year, we did one Pride pop-up and it was incredible and really like life-changing for the 30 queer creators that participated. And all of our businesses have grown so much um, throughout the past year. So this year it was like a tour to get across to Arkansas really. And um, <laughs> we did three Pride pop-ups this month. So I have been super busy doing that. And um, selling some copies of Bible Belt Queers, which has been really great to talk to other queer people all across the state of Arkansas, which is where I was born and raised. I'm in Tulsa now, but um, I was born and raised in Northwest Arkansas. So it's really 
um, great to be able to see a, a thriving queer community there now um, because, you know, growing up there, you really felt very isolated and alone growing up as a queer person there. So it's great. Hell yeah, that's awesome. I love mm -hmm. the one. What was it? The big gay what? Big gay big market? Gay market. That's yep. awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're doing some really amazing things in Northwest Arkansas. And now they're um, actually a nonprofit called Big Gay. So you can look them up. Um, oh, do they have agenda though? The big oh, yeah. <laughs> we, always, we always have an agenda. <laughs> The Lots big of gay pride agenda. pop up in supporting queer small businesses and you know rural communities. We think it's really important, um, and it's been able to give a lot of us a way to grow our businesses and kind of step out of our nine to fives um, and take that like power of production and creation into our own hands, which I think is super important. That's awesome. Um, I guess with the with the book in the zine, is it? Um... Is it, are they like personal narratives? Are they people's like actual individual stories or can people, um, can like queer artists like submit works of fiction and stuff like that? Or is this like a, what it would? Sure. Um, these have really kind of been all over the place. I think these have come from personal narratives um, as far as Bible Belt Queers, the book goes. Um, there's lots of poetry and like creative essays though. So it's not, so much as like this was my life story kind of thing but maybe like a glimpse at a person's life um growing up as a queer person there or maybe a poem about one specific aspect of their experience or like living at the intersection of multiple identities in the south um so a little bit of both um it's really grounded in personal narrative though and our personal experiences um growing up as a queer person in the bible belt um to of course, make sure that other queer people know that there are other people like them out there. Um, and we're here and creating and organizing and trying to make things better for future queer generations um, who, um, I, you know, I feel like those are the folks that are behind these credit card leaks, right? Gen Z is like <laughs> another animal and I am so, so living for them. Um, <laughs> But it's all it's always like old like millennials are just like look at right. the kids are all right the kids are doing well <laughs> somebody on somebody on tiktok said the uh, gen z's anthem needs to be teenagers by my chemical romance because they really just scare this they really just scare the shit out of me <laughs> mark you scare me <laughs> in like the most beautiful way like yeah i feel like the proud 18 you know mark um. <laughs> mark, mark is one warm energy drink away uh, one warm energy drink away from just 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 losing it <laughs> Relatable. a yeah. 80 degree monster sitting in the front of their car and that's in it instead of chain smoking that's what i do like <laughs> like the dad from Coraline, instead of like his little like cup of coffee like shakily it's me with an energy drink going 80 to work <laughs> You know, every, everyone's everyone's like, you know, uh, Roe being overturned is horrible. But really, what's going to cause the country to collapse is the fact that now jewels are uh, are you can't you can't get jewel pods anymore. So Zoomers are not going to be able to get their nicotine. So they're just going to go crazy, just burn everything down. That's really what's going to happen. It's done for. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> we thought life was already shit as a millennial. Just you wait. <laughs> just you wait. <laughs> You're either taking, remember what they took from you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I got to make that with a jewel pod. Remember what they took. Right. Oh man. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to pose this question. Like I, I, I am serious about shutting up and letting y'all talk, but like um, I, I'll pose this question to everyone. Um, when I go up North and I try to tell, because half my family is from New York and I have, I have roots in New York. So uh, when I go up north and I tell people like, hey, I'm from Alabama, it's always like the same questions. And like one of the big things is just like, oh, they, they're like, they're like kind of whisper and like hush because they're just like, they, one, they don't know like how I'm going to react until I tell them like, I hate fucking Republicans with a passion. Um, like they're like, are there, are there, are there gay people in the South? Like what, 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 what is this? I'm like, yes. <laughs> I have to explain like all this stuff, like all these communities. And like these organizations and things like that and they're just like their mind is just blown so it's like i'm really glad one that you're here darcy two that your organization is called bible belt queers because like so many people 
outside of the South think that like, granted, the South has problems. I'm not saying that it doesn't. We all know the South has problems. And like one of the reasons we have the podcast is to try to be like, hey, it's not all bad. There are some good people here. But I guess I opposed to to people who want to who want to answer like, you know, what would be like a big misconception about uh, the queer community in the South or like anything in, in that nature to the people who don't live in the South? You know, for me, that's another one of the reasons that I created this collection is not only to, you know, provide a form of like solidarity and community um, amongst queer people here, but also to let everybody else, you know, in the country know that like the stereotypes are false. There are queer people here. In fact, there's actually a lot of queer people here because we like systemically are paid less than other people and um, are fired for being queer um, in the South. And yeah, we're here and we're, we exist and we're creating and organizing and making art and building community. Um, yeah, and trying to make things better. Um, so it's unfortunate that those stereotypes exist that, you know, the South is backwards or just like uneducated or all hillbillies are like whatever. Like we love to like re re reclaim those like narratives now, um, especially the younger generations. But um, we miss out on a lot of opportunities because we are brushed off as being backwards or there being no hope for us or there not being queer people here or there not being feminists here. Um, we miss out on a lot of opportunities. We miss out on a lot of funding. We miss out um, on, you know, the recognition of the work that's being done by marginalized folks um, in red states um, because we are constantly fighting an uphill battle. Um, I actually worked in reproductive health for years before, um, you know, kind of branching off and doing my um, own art thing. So yeah, it has been a rough, it's been a rough week for queer femme folks. Um, you know, it's important to like, you know, think about the intersection of all of the identities that um, encompasses the queer community. Um, so, so, so yeah, that's like a really important point that you bring up. I think it's so important that these like narratives and stereotypes are kind of ridiculous. And it also really hurts the queer people that are like doing work in the South. It, it provides like just that extra barrier that we have to like push up against, so. No, definitely, for sure, for sure. Mark, you wanna tell us about, about Pride? You have some pretty cool stories about, about Pride. Oh, yeah. Well, like, um, I agree with everything you said, obviously. Um, and it's like, even on a personal level, um, it's um, just speaking for myself, of course, I almost feel like I would prefer someone being hateful to me here than someone being like, are you okay down there from somewhere else? Because at least I know where the people who are being hateful to me are coming from. And I kind of have like equal, like some common background with them. And I just, um, because people would, without knowing that I'm trans, without knowing that I'm queer, would just hear me say something. And they would probably loop me in with all of that too. And so I kind of feel like um, people from out West, like Northwest, um, cause I've had queer people, um, kind of discount what I say because they're from that region, almost like I'm not as educated about queer issues as they are because I'm down here. And so it's almost like I prefer this brand of, uh, prejudice because I know how to deal with it. And I know that most of it comes from people being misguided either way but um like at pride um this weekend um i live in a small city um like it's on the map but it's not it's still considered um rural um but um there were a handful of people upset because we had a drag queen reading um a book just that, that simple act of someone in a costume reading a book to children caused people to line up with like um, signs, whatever. And 
um, I think we are okay down here, regardless of whether people from outside of our region want to help us, because I noticed that even if um, they were up there like sweating, like really getting into it, um, that no one cared. Like we couldn't hear them very well. There are people that did like photo ops with them. Like I saw a couple of selfies with people like getting them in the background and like doing like the peace sign with like their best friend or their partner, their mom, whoever went with them. And I, I really love that we have reached that energy. And I don't know if it's because we're comfortable with it or that we don't have anything to fear anymore. Like it's either gonna be really bad or it's gonna be okay. And um, I don't know. I think that regardless of where we are, um, if we keep taking care of our communities the way that we have, then it doesn't matter what people from up north, a different country even um, have to say, because I think we're gonna take care of each other regardless of whether we're queer, whether we're, we were born women, identify as women, whatever we have going on, I think that we um, are gonna be able to do the right thing for each other. And so I don't have as much of a, um, oh no, I don't know what you'd call it. I don't kind of have like a, um, I'm not self-conscious about it anymore of what people really, um, like I'm not, like if I'm not doing, I'm not being queer right. Mm -hmm. Like I am letting myself be like, um, like I guess lack of a better word, like, oh, I'm gonna be um, like a hick in this way. And then, I'm also queer while I'm being like, I'm allowed to um, do things that make other people uncomfortable that are stereotypes. Absolutely. Because I'm just minding my own business being around people who want me to be around them. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, more and more people, regardless if, of whether they're my age or older, and they weren't allowed to express either um, they were too gay to be country or they were too country to be gay that now that, um, especially with the phrase uh, y'all means all has come out. That was like went on one of the banners um, at, the, um, at the festival. I think now that we're embracing the, um, that we can have both sides of this, that we don't have to abandon where we're from to be who we are, I think it's really going to work out in people's favors. I really love we don't have to abandon who we are to become who we are. I think that's so important. Um, yeah, it's important to embrace all the aspects of ourselves, whether they're like stereotypical or not, because um, I mean, who cares? It's the like responsibility of the people like spreading the stereotypes, I think, not like the people who maybe happen to overlap. I mean, a lot of us grew up in the country and rural and, um, you know, you can't just like erase that part of yourself. And I think it's important that we don't try to, you know. That was beautiful, actually, in the podcast. It can never, it can't get better than that. So thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Good luck with that, Nelson. Yeah. You can't yeah. Stop your mouth running, no matter what. I know. Although I will say, I will say for anybody listening to this and anybody who's been critical of him in the past, <laughs> we all, we all who have been hosts, or at least our hosts now agree that Nelson is by far the only one who has the gift of the gab and can actually interview people and the rest of us are hopeless introverts so when he, even in situations like this where he's like the last person who should be talking we are fine to let him ask the questions because we don't know what the hell we're doing <laughs> that's oh, the only time I'm going to defend you like this Nelson. thank you I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get Adam to just cut out that bit and I listen to it before I go to bed every night. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, don't do that for him. Please don't. Uh, how okay, Mark, you said something. I know you said it as a joke, but like as somebody who's not part of the community, 
like you talk about like being like how how do you how do you you said being queer right how do you queer wrong <laughs> like how do, this is, by being you, from down here holy sometimes okay. we are an anti-pacific northwest podcast we're <laughs> one we're anti-irish american and two we're anti-pacific uh, northwest i get that we have fans that are both I don't know why you still listen to this podcast, but whatever. <laughs> fuck you. Like, okay. <laughs> no, it's like, um, if you aren't like, um, without getting into like personal discourse within like, um, like queer communities, it's like, um, it's like you're allowed to be yourself up until, up until it doesn't fit in with, um, I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain. Like, it's like, um, I, I can try a little bit if you want. Yeah, yeah go, Kai. Of course okay. I do. The first, the first thing, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> first thing I'm going to say is that, um, being in primarily queer spaces, but also <laughs> that because of the way that the, the culture kind of grew and that queer culture was so repressed for so long and so it was kind of shoved into the most respectable areas that it could be for such a long time that means that queer culture kind of what's become acceptable is often very white very attractive very um neurotypical very able like all of that kind of put together so for one thing being a bi indigenous person means that my experience of queerness is nothing like most of what I experience through common discourse and through majority like white queer spaces and those tend to be the ones that ended up surviving either you find the really really niche ones that have had to become very protected in and of themselves because they're they're battling like the the hegemony of like whiteness for their spaces and also battling like the straight gays as well like all of this stuff so like black queer spaces indigenous queer spaces and all that they're they're very like insular and there's a good reason for that and if you're kind of online and looking for this for the first time looking for people that you can identify with for the first time you might not find them so you end up finding these larger queer spaces that are very very white and they have all these in jokes and cultural set pieces that just don't make any sense to you if you're not white and it can be further like alienating and you don't know what to do about it like there's a there's a lot of like very very like it seems harmless jokes where it'd be like oh you can have the the bisexual bob haircut and like well no I'm indigenous I keep my hair long for cultural reasons that bit of the culture doesn't apply to me and there are indigenous people who could go with that they do that anyway but it, it makes it more alienating and like there's nothing that you can really identify with so you can indeed be queer wrong in a lot of places if you come in there too hard being you know indigenous or being black or being asian or anything that doesn't go along with that that arcing culture you it's like oh you don't understand our in jokes well you don't really belong here we're not going to do anything to make you more comfortable here and there's a lot of like it's it's infighting but there's a reason why the infighting has started because like queer spaces have for so long had to fight for anything that they could get a hold of so any um like controversy or calling not even like calling out kind of even more calling in practices can make it feel like you're being under attack because you've been under attack for so long but then it's still not creating enough space for people who aren't exactly you know cis very attractive white male gays who have led some of these spaces for so long or um white cis lesbians who have their own kind of culture and it feels alienating being myself around them and and even though we have similarities in some ways we definitely don't in a lot of other ways so yeah if you're if you're country if you're disabled if you don't fit cultural norms of being attractive if you're anything but white there's like so like there are more ways to be queer wrong than there are to be queer right at this point yeah I 100% agree with that I think you make so many important points and not only do like some of these organizations and spaces like you know have these in jokes and little things that isolate other members of the queer community but a lot of them do like blatantly reproduce classism and racism and like systemically within their organization like you know only like white male leaders at the top and um you know the people 
that stay in power and have access to the money and the organizing and all of the connections, you know, they definitely keep that amongst themselves. Um, yeah, thank you for that, so important. Mark, did you say that the pride that they had in your town was the first one that they had in this town this year? Like um, it's the first one? Yes, first one. Um, and um, the, it was so big that they had to move it off of the like downtown strip to like a park nearby. Um, yeah, and um, there were, of course, no cops at pride. Very um, strong. Um, sentiment that I hold um but it was like um almost needed because in 2016 we had a clan rally on the front lawn of our police station and the way that our downtown area is set up um it's like there's a lot of like road access and so where it was moved to was kind of behind like the levee and so it kind of felt like um I actually scoped it out before um I called my friend and she met me down there um because it was just like a big wall of grass and if someone wanted to come in there was one little area they had they could pull in and one area that they could pull out and so it felt very safe and um it was like um it's the first pride we've ever had. And even though there was cops and corporations at our little small, um, I don't remember how many people they said ended up kind of coming around, but um, the people who talked at the event were in tears talking about how they thought this could never happen. Um, and one of the drag queens um, was talking about how they had to go to Atlanta every single year and they felt like they were lost because they couldn't relate to most of the queens who live in Atlanta and they couldn't relate to a lot of the gay people queer people who um, were in the metro area and they kept um, reiterating the fact that it felt like we're family and even though those people there were like a couple of protesters it was vastly outnumbered. I think there was only like maybe like a dozen protesters. Um, and it was pretty well um, advertised, I think, because they knew that Drag Queen was there and that she was going to be reading that book. Um, they had like their little laminated signs that they worked very hard on. Um, I'm sure their little speech was great, but no one could hear it. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> Like even like a couple people kind of went up there, but they um, like when I saw um, there was a man that went up there to kind of like um, record them and like, um, you know, make fun of them. Um, even though I was a little afraid because there's cops up there and there's other people up there. Um, it like immediately um, it seemed like people paid attention and it was almost like they were protected by just being held accountable because there was such a large group of us for once versus this small strip of people. And they're, they're going to do it again next year. And um, I hope it's, um, I hope it's bigger. But it was really nice and very humbling um, to um, hear someone get so choked up about something that I've taken for granted, really, because I've never had um, anyone shout anything at me before like that. Um, it's always been related to how I appear uh, female when people have shouted at me. Um, mm -hmm. It hasn't been like calling me um, anti-gay, anti-trans slurs because I don't really come off as that yet. Um, and so it's just, whether people like it or not, this is gonna keep happening in places and it's not just gonna be cities, it's not gonna be places that are historically more progressive. Um, 
it's going to keep being small towns and whether or not it's safe or not. And um, I, I think the phrase um, we're queer and we're here has been like kind of beaten the death a little bit. Um, I know it's kind of gone with the like uh, target merch kind of route, <laughs> but um, we like, have discussed how both of us own target merch. <laughs> look, I bought the little. I need something for my snacks in, so I bought the little silicone bowls, <laughs> and they're bi colors, so it's you know. Um, but um, like we've always. <laughs> I got the I got the Yas car shirt, so I guess I'm, yeah. I'm rolling. You're an ally. I am. I can't wait for that fucking shirt Nelson, to come in. Oh my god, we need to make that TikTok. Of the, this is Valentina. She's an ally. Say something, Valentina. And you get to the background. Uh, ally. <laughs> Mark, I'm gonna. What, <laughs> okay, so yeah. the shirt's on back order till August, but we're gonna get together. <laughs> you gotta do that. Ally, okay. I'm gonna have the Dale Earnhardt hat on. And once the, the jokes. Shirt on. Once the joke is like thoroughly dead, dead. oh my gone. god <laughs> yeah but yeah um and um i think um there was also a lot of um church presence which i uh personally um do not feel very comfortable with um not to you know i know that there's um people who are queer who go to church People who are leftists to go to church. It's just personally not my thing. Um, You're so but, sweet work when I have publicly attacked the Catholic Church on this show. <laughs> well, they were not Catholic churches. They were. Um, I'll attack them too. Right. Come on now. <laughs> Those Protestant bastards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but they had um, like the little free mom hug thing. And. Um, I could tell that there are like people who might not have um, really thought about any of these issues very hard or really um, thought that it didn't affect them very much were there with their kids. There were a lot of children. Um, there were um, children who were dressed um, like they wanted to have like people wear like rainbow stuff. Um, and so there were like um, kids and all like completely decked out and then um, very straight, very uncomfortable at first looking parents. And then I would see them again and they would like come in and just be like holding their kid's hand. And then I'd see them again and they would have had like face paint, like rainbow face paint on. And like the way that these children are allowed to explore this side of themselves um is something that i don't think um i know that i would have never had if i would have like come to this realization sooner um but it's it was very there was like enough kids to where they had to censor what they were saying on stage not because they had to but they felt like it was more respectful for the drag queens to censor themselves <laughs> so that, that the kids would enjoy it and not have like their parents wouldn't feel like they needed to leave but it was very cute yeah i have seen so so many kids at prides this year it's been so encouraging and so wonderful so i have a lot all of my art that i make is like feminine very blatant like feminist and queer art um so it's just been really awesome to see so many like young kids with their parents come up to pick out like their sexuality pin, you know, because like they know at like eight, like that concept is so far beyond me. Yeah. Um, amazing and wonderful. Like I can't imagine having the freedom to like understand and explore your sexuality and gender at that age, just because for like, my generation and where I grew up um that wasn't that wasn't a thing um so it, it's been so encouraging I have only experienced like one um like negative experience at pride this year um the first pride event that we did with the big game market um there were some men that drove by um in a really loud unnecessarily loud truck um 
and screamed slurs at us, you know, um, like right by where everyone was at and everyone just kind of like froze and like stopped breathing for a second, you know, because, you know, we don't know what's going to happen when that happens, you know, um, there's so many mass shootings every week in this country. Um, you just don't know. Um, it's so easy to get a gun <laughs> where we live. Um, and there is so much like open, like vitriol and hate that still exists in this space. Um, yeah, it can definitely be like hard and re-traumatizing in those moments. Um, everybody kind of like, once we realized they passed, you know, we all kind of let out a very collective sigh of relief and um, went back to like cracking jokes and, you know, doing the things that we do to like lighten the mood and make things easier. Um, but, you know, that danger is like very real and present. Um, and it's something that we like cognizantly realize like when we're organizing these things that this is, um, this is a possibility and it's something that we risk when we do something um, we do a big queer market in Arkansas. Um, there are people that, that are not gonna like what we're doing, but it's so important because you see all of these kids um, and their supportive parents out there. Um, and that's just really encouraging. And it like, you know, keeps us going to keep making these things and organizing these events and collections. Um, yeah, I think the queer folks in the South are really like laying kind of like, blueprints for like organizing that other places in the country should really like not be brushing off and like be looking at as a blueprint you know um queer folks and women of color in the south have long been organizing amongst the worst conditions and i think um yeah the the um the rest of the country should like not so much condescendingly ask how we're doing every once in a while but like really help us in like substantial ways um because and and yeah use us as like resources because we have been um organizing and working in these conditions for decades um and we're not gonna stop definitely it goes back to that meme you, we see like all the time it's just like writing the south off as like unsalvageable is like I forgot what it was like racist and classist and like your neighborhoods aren't better because you have a brick your neighborhoods aren't less racist because you have brick oven pizza shops and like craft beer places it's just like True. yeah but yeah um I guess the next the next thing and Kai did you want to talk about um like how colonization has affected like indigenous queer communities oh yeah you want me yeah. to go on that one I can yeah. go I can go on that one go it do it <laughs> um anybody who isn't aware um in most that I have found, um, indigenous cultures, tribes, nations in North America, and especially through Central America, have very different ideas when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to gender, and when it comes to the expression of both of those. So um, we do have strong histories of not just having um, what we now see is the gender binary of men and women. There's there's third genders, there's fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh genders in lots of these places. And that people who are not in the binary a lot of times held special places in their in their people, in their nations, and were considered people to go to to ask for their wisdom and for their medicine. And uh, medicine can be uh, both physical and spiritual in this case. Um, and that when colonization really started to well colonization especially bringing um christian religions especially um come came to north and central america um i would say south america but i've not studied there i would i would hazard a guess that they are very similar to the rest of us in north and central america but i just won't say it most of the time because i don't want to pretend that i know um but when when these um christian religions in particular were brought over um they brought over the idea of the gender binary of original sin making women subservient and wretched in the eyes of uh, the, their leadership um, and to get rid of this kind of gender and sexual expression and uh, also brought like um, being nude it does not have to be 
a expression of sexuality it can just be you know nude because you're in freaking california or in florida or some places where you live they're very very hot but seeing the nudity as solely a an expression of sexuality and then bringing shame with that and making people cover themselves and um, how they relate to the to the other people around them and how how they have sexual and romantic relationships that there's so much that we've lost there's there's a lot that we do know um histories that have been brought through into the current day and people who know who they are and what they are in their cultural um in their nations but there's so much that we've lost as well and a lot of that um colonization that's been kind of forced and assimilated into the indigenous people of these areas has um put a lot of that shame so there's a lot of places where um queerness or um how you express your, your gender or anything like that um were being viewed through that colonial lens so things like being two-spirit or being um, any other kind of third gender or being um, attracted to people who are quote unquote the same gender as you because again we've kind of lost the idea of what the genders are in these nations um, so it, through the colonial viewpoint being attracted to somebody who's the same gender as you brought shame and all of that but there's been such a huge resurgence of two-spirit identity and that's one thing is that I would like to say is that anybody who is um, in the LGBTQIA+, plus, et cetera, all the, the, the alphabet mafia, if you're in that and you are not indigenous, please, for the love of everything, do not call yourself two-spirit if you're not indigenous. You don't understand what that means. There will be, if you think you understand what that means, there will be a title for you that does not appropriate indigenous terms, because I promise you don't understand what that means within these nations. And as another thing is that two spirit tends to come from several like that term itself comes from a couple different tribes, mostly in in the Midwest and up into Canada. Um, and it's a term that we've kind of adopted in indigenous spaces because we've lost a lot of the language that was associated with these original terms. So we're kind of grasping onto the only term that we can all hold on to at the moment, and that's two spirit. So it is kind of a pan used term within indigenous spaces, but that doesn't mean that anybody who's not indigenous can use it. But two-spirit can also encompass your gender, it can encompass your sexuality and not necessarily, it can be either or or both. It's a Venn diagram of a lot of these things. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to adhere to more colonially used terms. You can't, you know, it's kind of like when you're learning a second language and you realize that this word doesn't have an exact English translation. And it, if you do translate it, it could take an entire English le like sentence to describe it. So um, there's a lot to learn when it comes to that and that we're very lucky that um, with the kind of shedding of the assimilation and the colonialism that's been coming out in the last couple of generations that people are finally feeling more comfortable with um, with who they are and expressing that within their own communities. I mean, I I personally like know of indigenous drag queens. I know indigenous two-spirit leaders, like huge leaders in indigenous activism. Um, a lot of our children are being aware of their identities very, very early on in a way that I don't remember back in the 90s and the early 2000s. They're, be, they're able to be aware of it so much earlier and be accepted for it so much earlier. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's really amazing, but it has taken the kind of wholesale getting rid of our colonial attitudes and recognizing the colonial attitudes and trying to strip them away and realizing, well, if you get rid of the colonial attitudes, then that means that there's so much room for everything else. Um, but yeah, that's like, I don't personally claim the two spirit title, mostly because I don't feel like I have a strong enough understanding of it. And that that's me. That's, that's like, if you have your average non indigenous person who's coming at it at a 101 level, you know, I'm, I'm several levels ahead of that and trying to understand it. And I still don't understand it fully. So <laughs> I don't use the term personally. However, my sister, who, again, I'm gonna have to explain my sister, we use that term. Uh, because in English and in our own language, we do not have a third gender term for that kind of 
like I could call them my sibling, but between us as family, I call her my sister, according to what she's what she has told me to call her. But um, she herself is two spirit, and not and she does not it really exist in the gender binary, and neither do her children. Um, so I have so many two spirits in my family, in my direct family, um, and so I'm kind of learning the language at the same time that they're understanding themselves as they grow up and how we're trying how my sister and I try to relate to each other in our own language and through English and realizing like we don't have the full language that we need for this at the moment so we're having to use kind of half terms to to relate to that but um it's it's a little demanding but at the same time it's really invigorating to, to see that um indigenous people are really really going for it really throwing off that colonial narrative and coming to realize who we are in our relationships to everyone around us. Yay. <laughs> Nelson. <laughs> you know, you know, if I bring her back here, you're just we're gonna fold you like a freaking deck chair. I, I, please when it do. Comes to all this. <laughs> I was waiting for just like somehow, like, I don't know, like I, I don't I don't know what's gonna happen. I was gonna be we sitting here one day you. and feel like a spirit just like crush my <laughs> neck and then like it's done. <laughs> I'll go, I will go personally and pick out your house in freaking Italy somewhere so that when the revolution comes, we know exactly where you're going. I'll send you your address beforehand. We got you this nice villa in Sicily. You're going to live there. No air conditioning, but nobody has air conditioning. Uh, it's beachfront, so okay. It's like where I, my background is, look, except there's no palm trees, but you know, it's something like that. <laughs> you're light you're light like me you're gonna go to sicily and just crisp oh, up like a little french fry it's, it's gonna it's gonna have to like come out of my like the the the, the tanness like lies dormant in me it's there i'm just away from my homeland and when i get there i'll start getting really dark like my mom and it'll be fine i'll be okay but uh but yeah turn the uh, color of pepperoni after it's <laughs> every no wait, okay totally change the subject real quick um so many of my friends right now are in Italy. I keep seeing like they've taken vacations to Italy, and I'm like, "Hey, call mom. them colonizers. They're not Italian. Call They're them not. colonizers." Hey, actually, no, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. Some of them are of, of Italian descent, so it's like they're just trying to. We're gonna visit Italy, yeah, okay, whatever. But like, I had to tell my mom because my mom was like, "You're not sent like all of my life. You're not sentimental at all." And I was like, "Hey, mom. Like all my friends, like everyone I know is going to Italy right now for some reason. Like, wouldn't it be cool? Like a mother's son. Like, you speak Italian. It'd be really fun to have like a." Other son uh trip to the homeland you could show me like where your your parents are from blah blah, blah etc and she's like i don't want it that nah, just excuses it's like damn it <laughs> that trying. means it's all up to you it is she was like you go i'm too old i was like yeah but you speak italian it'd be so much easier <laughs> to get around because you want a translator <laughs> <laughs> the deal was out the deal was out the there. deal the deal the deal is this <laughs> I'll carry her luggage because she there's no elevators. And it's all it's all poor and rural where we would go. There's no elevator. So I'd carry the luggage and she does the talking. <laughs> so I was like, this is, this is a good she likes to talk and I can I can carry big things. So there you go. <laughs> I'll be the pack mule <laughs> to run around Italy. But uh, you you wanna you wanna talk about this just to keep going on the aside. My cousin who has the same blood quantum as me. I want everybody to understand. My cousin has the same blood quantum as me, but his mother is English and they live in England. They're the only family I have on this side of the world. Um, <laughs> and I went to visit them this last weekend. And this, this guy, this motherfucking guy is so I see brown. The hand. I see he's the hand. so <laughs> fucking brown. And I'm so angry that he he's, born and lived in England and he's so brown and I am still the color of a fucking unused tissue. <laughs> and you grew up in Florida. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Mamma mia. <laughs> I saw your hand going like this. Right? I've been to, so like you, I've been to Italy. Hey, hey, hey. I've off been there. Hey, hey, whoa, hey. <laughs> I've been there twice. Uh, one day, one day. <laughs> <Contagious>. <laughs> After I watched, I watched him blow up one time and do the full finger gun like that. So now it's just, it's, <laughs> it's, I've been doing this show with you for a year and a half. It's going to come eventually. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of pride, those joke, those memes that are going around being like, yo, I don't know what gender this is, what flag this represents, but it's weird. It's the Italian flag. <laughs> it is weird. We're, we're all for, we're for 
that the I in LGBTQIA is obviously Italian at this point, right? <laughs> Just like the I in my pocket's Italian. <laughs> poor these poor indigenous and intersex people have to deal with you fuckers <laughs> in their acronyms all the time <laughs> that'll be that'll be the new one the triple i indigenous intersex italian that'll be the new, that'll be the new no because we're gonna look like three percenters Fuck oh that. no you're right no <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh man all right we have a lovely guest we come do. with another question Dar- <laughs> <laughs> yeah darcy thanks for putting up with us <laughs> a great time <laughs> um i think the i think the so the big thing um i have to uh i have to see what my friend sent me but the big thing that's coming down the pipe i guess with uh with the supreme court and talk about the future um what clarence thomas said basically in um in in his opinion right for in his congruent opinion in the uh in dobbs behold women's health um about looking at re-evaluating Lawrence v. Texas and Obergefell. So Lawrence v. Texas, if people don't know, is a Supreme Court case that struck down Texas' sodomy laws. And then also Obergefell is, in 2015, obviously granted um, the right Listen, to are get Are you married. saying Oberfeld? Obergefell. Is it the G? You pronounce the G in that? Obergefell. Okay. Obergefell. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, Berg. Yeah, I'm used right. living. It, I'm used living over here where letters just fucking disappear. No so. <laughs> oh, okay. don't save the queen, so <laughs> we pronounce the H in herbs, but nowhere herbs. else. <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh, oh, Burger fell. Yeah, I can't. It's a Burger fell v. I forgot what but everyone just calls it a Burger fell. Um, 2015, obviously legalizing same sex marriage. But with Clarence Thomas opening the floodgates, uh, someone, one of my friends sent me today, uh, if you want to get ahead of this, the Texas Attorney General is calling the Supreme Court to overturn Lawrence v. Texas. Uh, Alabama also has anti-sodomy laws on the books that make it a Class A felony. Um, so it, it, the whole thing now is worrying, like, is that on the chopping block? So, like, uh, the, the Supreme Court has opened the floodgates, basically, now, um, everyone's everyone's favorite everyone's favorite leprechaun, Kavanaugh has said in his congruence that like, oh no, it's like we're gonna like everything else is fine, you know. I, I just you know I don't like I don't like Roe, but like everything else is gonna be okay. But like I don't believe a damn thing he says. Obviously, well yeah, we know he's full of shit. Yeah, so. he's completely full of shit. Um, so that's the thing is the future is just like what happens what happens now and like what. I don't really have a question. It's just like, I'm just kind of venting it, ranting at this point that uh, what happens when this goes away? And like, I don't think people realize that like, I was thinking about this today. Um, I don't know how to word this. It doesn't just sound horrible, but like uh, for the anti-sodomy laws for people who don't understand, it's not just uh, what people think like quote unquote, like uh, homosexual or queer sexual intercourse, right? This affects like everyone. And it's, it's, it's something that like, this is, and then like, it's, it's in the age of like digital marketing. And if everyone knows what I'm talking about, like people's side incomes that happen to be on certain websites are going to affect them. You have visual evidence that you're breaking the law and committing a felony. And then on top of that, oh, Burgerfell, if that falls, you have people who are married, who have kids, who have joint incomes, who have jobs, who have all this stuff taxes everything and on top of loving each other and being married that gets stripped away then what happens to the kids what happens to the income what happens to the houses what happens to these people's lives can just be shattered because five decrepit fucking racist drunken idiots jackasses decide that uh you know fuck you and your rights it's just it's crazy and i think people really finally uh everyone thought I think majority of people thought, oh, Roe will never fall. It's 50 years. No, it's fine. It'll never. But now it has. I've been saying for decades that yeah. it's in danger and that we should be like paying attention yeah. to it. And this. no one listened. And like no yeah. one, no one fucking listened. And then like, the, but like, yeah. yeah, no one listened. Like Mia, for example, who's been on our for abortions, like, it's like, like three different episodes, we like, this is gonna happen. We've been saying this for years. And still people are like, ah, nah, until like it happened. Then people are like, yeah oh shit, how could this happen? What's going to happen next? Well, they already told you what's going to happen next. Lawrence Obergefell 
and Griswold. Let's not talk about the fucking right to contraception. And it's 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 maddening. And it's just like as someone who studies political science and and somebody like personally just from an academic standpoint understands like the like the how powerful these cases are. Um, I don't think, I really still don't think people are like. I think people are in a state of shock, but like that's wearing off and people are going to have to come to the realization that like, this is not going to end because the docket, there was also another one. Um, there's also, the Miranda. yeah, Miranda. And there's also, no, there's another one coming up, uh, in the next docket. Hold on. The next, where is it? Ah, here we go. Uh, Kai and Mark, I wanted to uh, show, tell you guys this, if y'all didn't know that, uh, just wanted to come back. The Child Welfare Act is scheduled to be reviewed by SCOTUS next term. Oh, uh, yeah. What that is, um, what was that? The uh, If the ICWA is overturned, that could mean the end to federal Indian law, essentially end federal recognition of tribal sovereignty. Like that's on the books now. I mean, that's that on the chopping be, block. That would be a death knell. That would, yeah. <laughs> the protections that indigenous people are quote unquote afforded <laughs> in a situation when they're supposed to be sovereign nations in the first place who have had their land stolen not given stolen and and so much of the country stolen there were some some rights who who some nations who signed over rights to some land but that's not the majority of north america at all um that these rights and i want to say that with as much sarcasm as i can every time these rights mm -hmm. that are afforded us by governments that are that should not have any authority over us um are the only reasons why mm -hmm. some the some of these nations are alive at all and it's also the reason why they're in such poor condition to begin with because it's these it's <laughs> to go into the entire fucking history of colonization and land rights and how this impacts indigenous people would take a very long time, but to go as quickly as I can from the beginning to the end where we are right now is that every time the land has been taken away, indigenous people have been shuffled onto poorer and poorer pieces of land with less access to life giving resources. I don't like saying resources because that sounds like we're using the earth just to sustain us. It's a symbiotic relationship, but using the English language, I'm gonna say resources. So every time they move us onto land that has poor water resources, poor soil, resources poor areas to grow poor areas to hunt and all of the areas around them are stripped of these anyway given to farmers given to cities that take as much as they can from the surrounding areas to infect the water to make sure that hunting areas don't, oh, froze. don't have oh. sustainability for the animals that live there so you don't end up having animals to hunt sorry are you froze for a second no, I'm sorry, um, but yeah, okay. So yeah, these these areas these areas are forced to be impoverished, and indigenous people are shuffled onto these areas, and then given some piddling little protection over those areas from the federal government, especially in the United States and Canada. The laws are different, but in the United States, they're they're given these these few thin little crumbs on the ground rights in these areas, and to extinguish that means to extinguish the the little protection they have from these areas and the people around them from exterminating what they have left exterminating the the plant and the animal life the health of the earth and the water that's in those areas because i don't know if any of y'all have seen that indigenous people across the planet are by far the ones who are protecting animals and environments water. and water and the health of the water and all of these things they're the ones who are there protecting it um, so this is, it's not just a way to extinguish indigenous rights and Native American rights, if we're going to go just, just straight for the American issue, Native American rights in these areas and the protections that you might have and the recourse that you have to the federal government in, 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 um, in federal cases, in Indian law, in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, in Indian Health Services and all, like this is, this would be extinguishing all of that and if you and the reason that like the american state has wanted to do this since its inception because if you can extinguish the right that indigenous people are our own people our own sovereign nations and you make us a race rather than a class for lack of a better word we're a class of people um that means that you can 
take away all of those protections, what little we have left, you can take away all of that. And it's the, it's, it would be the, the pinnacle of assimilation in the United States. Um, not that in, indigenous people would suddenly become not indigenous, suddenly forget all of our teachings and what we know about the land that we live on, but it would, it would bring us to the point that we have no recourse for protection for any of those things. Um, and it, believe you me, if they can, they will, because as long as we retain those protections, we get more, we get their money, we get their time, we get little access to resources, we get that land. Um, like, it, they would do this just to get Osage land at all. Like, Osage land in uh, Oklahoma that has the, the oil wells on it, like, if they would extinguish all indigenous rights just for that land, much less the rights of the land that's in the Pacific Northwest that has all the old, old growth forests and the salmon rights and um, people across the Midwest that like, this is why the Black Hills, like they would get rid of these rights for the Black Hills themselves because the Black Hills have gold in them. Like there's, <laughs> there's so many reasons why they would do this. And it's so, it's, that would be a tipping point. That would be a death knell as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, it would be really, really bad. And I'm not sorry for ranting about this, but I want everybody who listens to remember that it's not just the little parts of it. It's, they, if, when you say like getting rid of Roe could just mean getting rid of abortion rights. There's other things that will be attached to that. Mm -hmm. There's other things that we, we might not even be aware of. People who have been in, the, in this for a long time will probably be more aware, but you know, being kind of middle- person myself uh i'm not even aware of how far this could end up going oh. and with, with all of these other cases it can go way farther than the one point that we're talking about now um so yeah fight tooth and nail for every single one of these please or, I, oh yeah go ahead sorry all right well <laughs> um how many of these have to get overturned before people realize that we live in a white supremacist state. Like, it's the, like, not to be, um, to sum it up in like a simple, uh, make it seem like it's just one thing, but the common thread throughout all of this is just making it as um, easily digestible for the like um sorry uh the uh like we were saying earlier about the the people who colonized this land are they all have had this in mind from the beginning and I, i'm sorry it's just kind of like blowing my mind that people don't think that it's as serious as it is because it started with Roe, and then it's going to hit, okay, so maybe you aren't a woman. Maybe you aren't in, interested in, maybe you're not a biological woman, excuse me. Um, maybe you aren't interested in biological women. Okay, maybe you don't care as much as you should. Um, and then maybe you aren't gay. And then maybe you aren't indigenous. Maybe you aren't in a whatever they're attacking at that moment but they're not just gonna want to take these little small things from people they're gonna take they're not gonna stop mm -hmm. and then it's there's no until it's just as puritan as it can get and as easy for them to just ravage what they want as it can get and well, it's erase us from history books and stuff already so right. you know I think that's really important to consider also with what you're saying is like they're already covering their tracks you know yeah. and so like, yeah like they until it happens to some people maybe they won't care but it's not going to matter at that point it are it's already slipping past that and I don't, I'm not sure, of course, me personally, but I'm not sure what um, easy solution there is other than to take these people seriously. 
like it's just it's not just oh they they won't do that oh it couldn't happen like yeah that sucks but surely they'll um, have a conscious about this one it's not <laughs> they're not good people I think that I think that us growing up in the south all of us like I think one thing like I'll go back to the the 2016 election right when people are like oh Donald Trump could never win mm -hmm. um we have all heard if, if we were right raised by boomers like if we if we have all heard uh somebody in our family way before Donald Trump say the exact same things that Donald Trump was saying right somebody mm -hmm. uh Josh Moon I think it was Josh Moon he's a, a, a local journalist said like welcome to the Alabamification of America like we have been dealing with Trump level politicians since at least 2010 when they all took power in the south the state houses right so like everything that donald trump i would tell people like everything donald trump said on tv i heard old white men say at the bar at the restaurant i worked at every single night for five years and then finally they found a savior and a politician i'm doing the hand thing and donald trump <laughs> and they voted for him in mass and the democrats put up an extremely weak candidate like let's just be real like grand yeah hillary would have been better than trump but she's extremely weak candidate and trump won not to rehash all that nonsense from 2016 but i think that our lived experience of living in the south like we know they're not gonna that's what i'm trying to tie it into we know they're not gonna stop like substantive due process that was founded uh in the 60s with griswold right that affects people don't realize that affects so much stuff like it's griswold it's your right to contraception right because there's two cases griswold i can't remember the other one that established access to contraception for not just married people there's a separate case for unmarried people right then it's roe v wade and then it's casey versus planned parenthood which both are now gone then it's lawrence uh, v texas and now it's obergefell like it's your right to get contraception it's your right to do whatever sexual act you want with an, a consenting adult and it's your right to get married to whoever you want to get married to though well a burger felt does have an equal protection clause to it but they will strip those things they will not stop this is an extremely reactionary institution that is a now a majority catholic institution where people don't realize as someone who grew up catholic the catholic church when it comes to we've all ranted and raved, raved about this before but like they have been adamantly against all of that since the 1800s <laughs> like they really hate this shit well, and now I think it's uh, also about they have lost so much of the workforce here in the United States because of how um, they handled COVID mm -hmm. and how they did not support their citizens. So they've lost so much of the workforce. And I think a lot of it is also about making sure that they have people to exploit for their labor. Like this is 100 percent also like a class issue that people should be paying attention to because, you know, it is keeping poor people poor and working for them mm -hmm. for it's, you know, um, if people are having children, they can't step out of the workforce like so many people have been doing throughout the pandemic, even if they didn't, you know, like pass from COVID or like become COVID was also like a mass disabling event as well. Um, so, you know, they they lost a lot of the people that they were exploiting. So they have to keep us under their thumb somehow. And if people are having children because they have no other choice, then they're tied to these exploitative jobs that are paying us what they were paying people in like yeah. the 1950s and 60s, you know? So like, um, you know, they they will have to make less changes for their to, to their society, less changes like addressing the minimum wage and all like work pre workplace protections and all of these things as well. Um, but if people have no choices and no options and they have to support their living children, um, they'll do what they have to do and they'll stay in an exploitative workplace and stop calling out this like like blatant exploitation that we're really seeing across the country. And it's but let, that has been like doubly highlighted since the pandemic and mm -hmm. how companies have treated their employees and yeah there <laughs> there's like so many connections with this one thing you know I think it's important like you know like you were saying um you you might not have a uterus you might not be gay but like there are things that are gonna affect you um and you have to pay attention to really like all of the reasons that they are doing these things right 
If you want to get like, really dark, I was just saying, if you want to get really <laughs> dark, they tie it into uh, the white birth rate is declining and they can't, we can't, the white population can't reproduce at a fast enough rate to keep white people the majority so that's some really dark shit if you really want to go down that rabbit hole there aren't enough white babies to adopt right now you know like they want th those those are the adoptable the, the other other what, the other other white meat <laughs> jeez nelson <laughs> but, i'm like, sorry go ahead. quite quite recently um the three of us the hosts have been party to a conversation with somebody who is so frustrated that um and i i don't blame them for their frustration i want to say that outright um that they they're so frustrated that they just want to cut off um anybody who's not already an avowed leftist who wants to you know do whatever it takes in extremely loaded terms um, do whatever it takes to affect the change that we see as the the best thing that could possibly happen to us um, they want to cut off everybody who's not already doing that or is not already an avowed ready to throw down kind of person. And again, like I said, I understand their frustration because I remember what it's like to be that frustrated and just so frustrated with the people around you who don't see what you see. And then we all end up suffering the consequences for it. And like, I get that. But at the same time, um, what we're seeing in these situations is people who have been brought so low by circumstances that they can't possibly and in in some cases they can't see that a change could be affected by large-scale action or they can't um, in a lot of cases they can't allow themselves to be put in that kind of situation because the social safety net is so stripped away there is no social safety net there is there is you have a job therefore you have health care and you're paying taxes or you're dead those you are don't. the two cases that you're in right now and we can't afford to be discounting people who are in that kind of situation who've been made victims by the state but victims by the people that are supposed to be looking out for their welfare that um yeah, they might be they might be blinded by fear. They might be blinded by miscommunication. They might be blinded by um, a school system that had every reason to teach them to be um, blindly mindful of the state and of quote unquote due process and voting and everything like that. These are people who have been taken advantage of at every turn and are trying to do whatever they can to keep their kids alive, to keep their kids healthy, to keep their parents healthy. If they're disabled, keep themselves healthy, to have food on the table, to have a roof over their head. And people are losing that at a rate that is unseen since the depression right now that people are losing this so quickly. And I understand the frustration. I think we all can understand the frustration, but I implore people that are that kind of frustrated who are already avowed leftists, who are ready to throw down for whatever reason um, to take care of the people who are around you. These are the people who are going to be in your community if that revolution comes. These are the people who are in your community right now, who if maybe they have better access to childcare, maybe if they have a full stomach, maybe if they can afford an antibiotic if they get sick. You know, maybe if they have those things, maybe then they can have the bandwidth, the space in their mind to consider what it would take to create a better, a better world for themselves and for the people around them. But it, it cannot be overstated that the people who were meant to be watching out for us, the people that we, we elected to try to keep things running right, the people that we took jobs with because their companies kept your your table with food on it. And these people who are in power, they're the ones who are constantly taking. They are the ones who are taking, not the people who have been victimized and led astray at every fucking turn. Um, that it's so easy and so understandable right now to be utterly devastated by what happened and what is likely going to continue to happen by what what Clarence Thomas said in that horrifying thing to think that oh yeah we're not only going to strike this down i am actively thinking of other things to strike down to make things even worse for people it is so easy to be 
to be devastated by that. And it's understandable and that it's going to take some time to recover from that and figure out what we're going to do from here. But that doesn't mean that you need to be the one that is leading the charge and keeping people with access to abortion. I can guarantee you there's already people out there who are doing it and are better at doing it and are better at understanding the laws and have access to understanding the laws and people who can help them with that. And contacts and all that you don't have to be that one you don't have to be the one that's telling people oh let's go camping wink wink like you are getting everybody potentially in trouble like that um sit by listen to the people who already know what they're doing and help them like i don't know if anybody's seen seen the meme saying that like americans are not cowards but americans like to envision themselves as the heroes you don't have to do the little bits every time to ensure safety you want to be the one to run in and save the child from the burning building well this is one of those cases where you have to actively fight that you have to fight that inclination to be the what i'm going to run in and save this person who wants to have an abortion by taking them camping in fucking massachusetts or something like that i'm going to be the one who's sourcing penny royal for them that will just as likely probably make them die rather than just getting rid of an unwanted pregnancy like you don't have to be that you need to be looking for the streams that are already doing this the people yes. who are already aware mm -hmm. of it and following their leadership and once you're once you have found you've let all of that grief and that frustration simmer down and look towards what you're going to do from here because i can't tell you not to feel something but if you feel that once you've let it simmer down follow the people who already know what they're doing that will keep you safe and the people around you safe 100 percent agree i think that's so important it definitely need to be said um yeah there are networks there have been networks for decades and the work is um, being done. So just tune into your local communities. I 100% agree. Invest in like local abortion funds, local farmers, people growing their own crops, start to barter, like start to do your best to build up your local network to rely less on the system that is exploiting us. I think, you know, yeah, it's totally natural to grieve and be upset. And like, we're all experiencing collective trauma in that can like not be understated, but like also you have to just do what you can and plug away, but you can't do everything and you shouldn't try because that is the fastest way to burn out. And these kinds of things are truly like a lifetime marathon. So, um, and yeah. definitely be there for your trans comrades, your trans siblings, your trans people who are like hearing a lot about women's bodies and women's rights and women's contraceptive and things like that. It's not just women who can get pregnant. Absolutely. Be there for your trans people who are in your circle. They're going through some shit now as well. Right. And help like spread that conversation and like messaging and an inclusion for reproductive health and reproductive rights amongst people that don't like necessarily understand because like you said it's really tempting and easy to just like cut people off and not deal with them anymore but like you will have more sway with your loved ones and people who have known you and loved you than some random internet stranger will you know um so if there's anyone that's going to reach them it's someone that they know and love so i think it's really important yeah to not disengage in those ways this episode's kind of turned into group therapy. <laughs> I told you that's what we're going to end up. That's the sun heading of the right. show is group therapy. <laughs> so it was bound to happen. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but um, so like to just to kind of wrap everything up, uh, Darcy, is there anything like I, I know I brought you on to talk about bio belt queers. Is there any like while we wrap this up, give you the final word. Is there any anything else you want to talk about about your organization uh, that we left out? Like just go 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 ahead. I know this. Like I said, this is funny. It's turning to group therapy. We're all like kind of traumatized. What the fuck has been going on? Um, I think for me, one of the biggest things has been to like tr channel my frustration into like art, into protest art, into um collections or projects that can make some semblance of difference on this world, um, whether it's with contributors or like with the community that reads them. Um, but I think it's so important that, you know, to channel your grief and to channel um, this like pent up energy and aggression um, because we can use it in productive organizing and art making ways. I think that's so important. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna echo build your local communities, really invest in the networks that are there. I think that's, so important and like pay attention to what southern activists are doing on the ground because like mm -hmm. 
been plugging away for a long time and will continue to do so. And I think it's so um, important because we're definitely facing the most hostile environments um, than anyone else in the country. Um, but if you're interested, if you're a Bible Belt queer person, you're interested in participating in the upcoming collections, please do. Um, the zine is a little bit different than the book. It is kind of, it's definitely like Riot Girl inspired, zine culture inspired. So it is very like cut and paste and it could be poetry, essays, visual art, um, kind of whatever you wanna do. The deadline is um, October 1st. So you have some time to create something and channel that anger and frustration. You can find all of my work on ptsfeminist.com. So if you need um, to grab one of the collections or you're interested in participating in the upcoming zine, you can find all that info there. Definitely. And, and definitely send me those links and I'll tag them in the show notes. Um, if you have like a, if you have a link tree that has everything, if you have like something separate for each thing or whatever, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Awesome. But, uh, Thanks so much. Yeah. Hell yeah. But yeah, well, echo what Darcy said. You hear that Portland? Listen to us, Portland. Okay. <laughs> you out there, Portland, you hear us? <laughs> Seattle. Don't forget Seattle. Yeah. Seattle and Portland. You, you damn anarchist up there. Some of San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> It's cool. We had some, we had some good, we had some fans up there and we love you, but we're just giving you shit. Like y'all give us shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on Darcy. I got the outro and then uh, stick around for a bit. We'll chit chat and then we can all get some much needed rest. Most likely. Um, at Dixieland, and the proletariat, we leave the South to rise again, but this time for the right reasons. Those being worker owned means of production, decolonization and self-determination for all oppressed peoples. Make sure to click on our link tree. Yeah. Make sure to click on our link tree in the show notes to find all of our social media. We are coming to you from the birthplace of the civil rights movement, Montgomery, Alabama, as well as sweet Georgia and jolly old England. We would also like to recognize we're recording on occupied land that rightfully belongs to the Muscogee Nation and the Creek Nation. Uh, Darcy, thank you for coming on. Uh, Bible Belt Queers sounds awesome. And I hope that our listeners that are listening that uh, do art and do poetry and do stories, everything will definitely... Uh, send you send you some stuff to put in uh the magazine and everything i think it'd be great um mark these cannot be the same men that dolly was begging jolie not to take <laughs> <laughs> and out of 10 <laughs> cut, that's it <laughs> <laughs>